I am so thrilled that I have the gift of teaching the world's best and brightest, uh, and they're also just some of the finest, uh, finest uh, young people. So I want to invite all former students, bar one, who I'll give a special introduction to, come on up here, sit down, I'll do a quick introduction, and we're going to have our conversation. Let's give them all a well sure. applause. Um, I want to, I'll do the introductions in a minute, but I want to remind us, so we're talking about what are millennial perspectives. And let me start with a disclaimer. All generalizations are false, even this one. So this is what the people who study age would say. And there's a bit of debate where some generations start and stop. But essentially, the traditionalists, which include the greatest generation, you'll see their birth. These are birth years. The baby boomers, which most of us am eyeballing in this room, are part of. Uh, the Gen X, uh, which is a generation sort of slipped through, got a bit of stick uh, from folks. And now these amazing millennials, uh, uh, sometimes called the Y generation, and a bit of a debate when they start and end, but essentially uh, all of our wonderful panelists fall in the millennial category. Yes. And, and, and I have been in countless meetings with some of the organizations that you work for in my advisory work who are trying to understand millennials as if you're this big mystery. So let's jump into that. Let, let's take um, uh, the, this, this um, so this thing that was a little bit in that skit where, where everybody is special and everybody gets a prize even if you just show up as opposed to the person who really is in first. Like, how do you all think about that? Who wants to jump in first? So as a tennis player, I really hated the idea that everyone deserves a prize no matter what they, if they won or not. Right. Um, and that's, that's something that happens a lot at school, I think. And that's not necessarily, I think, you know, my fault as a student. I really wanted to win and I wanted to get the first prize. And I didn't want someone who I was better than to be, you know, I guess, not, I don't want to say treated equally, but like right. be given the same, oh, you're just as great as that guy who won. Yeah. Um, and that was something like the teachers were doing a lot. And that was kind of the initiative that they were passing down from the school to us. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously our teachers might not be millennials. So in, in a way, I don't know if that's necessarily the millennials fault, but right. that's kind of what we were being taught. Interesting. But on the other hand, I also like, when I wanted to play tennis and pursue it professionally, I, uh, I went to on, on, on online school. Um, and part of that was because my parents thought that, you know, apart from the fact that I'll have more time playing tennis and to travel and do stuff like that, right. was that they wanted me to really go out there and learn what it's like to, to take sacrifices, to, to lose, to win, and mm -hmm. realize you have to fight for you know, things in life to really earn them. So oh. I think that was kind of the way I see it. Sounds a little bit like the greatest generation, doesn't it? Fight for things, work hard, sacrifice. Uh, I got to tell one quick story. I made the mistake. I'm, I'm a tennis nut, and I love to play. And I made the mistake of saying, uh, say, hey, let's go hit sometime. And I said, let's wait till class is over so there's no conflict of interest. And so we went out and played one summer. And, and I said, look, this is the stupid part. I said, don't treat me as the prof. Just play your game, right? No <laughs> treats. Six loves, six one later, and I know he gave me that game. Uh, and I'm, I'm just like dying and huffing, and he's like barely cracked a sweat. So that was my big mistake. What, were you going to jump in? The, yeah. I, you know, the, the, the notion that everyone gets a trophy just eviscerates the notion of merit. Uh, and, you know, if everyone's a winner and nobody's a winner, uh, no, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not the biggest uh, thing for me about the generation, but I would echo pretty much what you said. Yeah. I mean, do you all f feel part of this generation, or is that the last thing in your minds? Have we created a false construct here, or what do you, what do you, who wants to jump in on that? Danny, go for it. Sure, I think many of the, many of the critiques that you pointed out are absolutely correct, um, and many of them are wrong. Yeah. Um, I think that, like any generation, it's a broad spectrum of experience. Um, I would pose the question, uh, who are our parents? Um, yeah. And why do we have this sense of entitlement? Um, and that, that, could be, that could be from us, mm -hmm. but I, I pose that question. Yeah. And there are, there are I, we don't have time, but there was a video I was going to show of a, of a researcher who thinks there are four different reasons that some of these attributes, to the extent that they're valid as generalizations, where to put the blame. And he goes out of his way to say, it's not you, the millennials themselves. It's a mixture of uh, uh, your education, your parents, technology, and I forget what the fourth one is, that have... Uh, that, Simon Sinek? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, and do you buy that argument, uh, Simon Sinek? Yeah, I think that every generation is a, a result of the generations before it um, and the circumstances with which it is existing. Yeah. Um, so if you look at Maslow's uh, you know, law of... Uh, hierarchy, thank you very much. Um, I would say we were blessed and cursed with uh, literal you know, silver spoons. Mm -hmm. We had everything kind of taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, and so there probably is a sense of entitlement, a sense of uh, 
a banality about life maybe that, that previous generations didn't have. Yeah. And so we're seeking that purpose, perhaps because of that. That's interesting, almost because of so many blessings that you're wanting to get beyond the material stuff to something of deeper meaning. Very interesting. Kate, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was thinking, um, in some way, um, everything with social media and just the, the new technology um, and opportunities we have almost exacerbates deeper um, tensions, whether specific to young people or to Western society, let's say. Um, I think it, it brings more to light faster. So can you give an example? What, what's that Absolutely. look like? Absolutely. So um, virtual reality, this sort of field that I've jumped into, um, which is 360 video, um, I think about it so like... So for someone who doesn't know, you put on a set of goggles uh -huh. and suddenly I'm in Rome watching them get blessed. <laughs> I mean, exactly, right? exactly. Or yep, suddenly I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on a spaceship. Totally. Or I'm in the middle of a rodeo. So that's, it's, it's, if you don't know virtual reality. Sorry, I actually go ahead. have a headset with me. So if anyone would like to try out, I can show it to you. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I call it the internet on steroids because I think um, it just has such a sense of experience and immersion that's so much deeper. And that's something I see in our generation in general is as um, opportunity increases or, or connection through the internet, um, there's a sense that. Um, if I can say things that are dark get darker, but there's an opportunity as well um, for, for increased um, dialogue. So what would something on the internet be that's dark uh, and can be darker? The, the porn industry has really taken the VR space yeah. and run with it. Um, but Because isn't um, it like a massive percent of the revenue uh, streams are all either the direct or indirectly supporting the pornography industry online, is that right? Yeah, I bet. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but the documentary um, field is also taken. Um, this. There's um, uh, the idea of empathy is something that um, these new immersive technologies, I think, can really create an experience of like never before. Hmm. That's interesting. So better chances to develop empathy. Yes. Did I hear that right? Yes. And yet this shadow side, this, this dark side, yeah. No, in fact, there, there's, a, the, there's a whole bunch of information about uh, pornography addiction, and it doesn't matter what your walk in life is, clergy, regular people, male, female. It's, uh, yeah, it's a big dark side, you're right. But then there's these beautiful possibilities. Duality. Duality, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what are some of your other reactions to the things when we were peppering out ideas? Yoni, any thoughts as, as you've been thinking this conversation? Well, look at you, you're, you're doub doubly blessed. <laughs> Stereo, yeah. I guess something I've been Maybe trying, a little higher, thanks. something I've been trying to understand is the way I've tried to deal with certain things at work yeah. has been often met with backlash. I guess I work at a larger institution and things are very systematic and you work for people who have sort of been in the markets for a long time and they have a way of looking at things, they have a, a routine. Yeah. And all of a sudden they have someone working for them who's two years out of college and they keep suggesting, oh, why don't we change it to this mythology or add these in? And, it seems like there's pushback, people aren't comfortable. Mm. Um, and while I also acknowledge that it's important to understand the history of things and how they've been conducted and made and what's led it to this point, I think looking at your forwards is very important. So there's that uncertainty and that hesitation with you know, changing the way we, we do things. And I think that kind of has extended the gap between one generation to the next. And do you sense some of like the old timers on Wall Street are, uh, s who are used to working horrendous hours, seven days a week, uh, and now a lot of the banks have put in place that if you don't tell the analysts by 12 noon on Friday or something, like you, you can't come to have them do a deal late at night and all that. Like, every, every time something comes up, the, their response is always, when I was your age, or when I was in your seat, and then yeah. some incredible story that makes you feel, I shouldn't be complaining, like I have it so good. <laughs> Which is, uh, yeah. Uh. You know, and, and while, we're, while we're on that, tell me, uh, as, we, as you know, this group, we kind of move in and we think uh, uh, sort of how do different faith traditions help us. So uh, does, does that, does, do you find your, your faith as, as, a, as being Jewish that that is an obstacle? Does it help you? Like, how does that play out in Wall Street? It's a pretty intense place. I think it's, um, so I, I had done two rotations. On the first desk I was on, nobody was Jewish. Mm -hmm. So the high holidays had come and I tried to go home and they said, no, you need to be here. Right. Um, you know, it was Yom Kippur, which is sort of like a day of atonement and mourning, and the responses were... Sort of like were, it is. <laughs> it is. And the responses were, oh, like, enjoy your holiday with your family. As if you're going to the beach. A exactly. Yeah. Um, but I've sort of moved to a different desk where people also partake in those traditions and understand and are much more cognizant, so I think it's 
almost situational and it yeah. can be very tough to pull yeah. both things off since so much responsibility can lie on one person sometimes. Well, it must be tricky also because you're younger, you're starting your career, you want to make a good reputation, you don't want to make waves. I mean, no one does, forget religion, but just in general. Um, and, and do you feel sometimes you have to compromise a bit to kind of be one of the team and that sort of stuff? Yeah, and I think to an extent that leads you to sort of overload at certain periods of time. Like you go home and it's the weekend and there's physically no work to do and you kind of just rebel in it. And then there's this stark dichotomy where you come in Monday and that's over and you don't think about that until you go home on Friday. It's very hard to keep it consistent. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so Zach, you're also in, in the finance sector. Uh, uh, do you find tension between your faith, whether it's your faith teaching or practices, sort of certain holidays that are important? Uh, you know, I think of, uh, let's say, Ash Wednesday. Do you go into work with a cross near your forehead and of, of ash? And or what are people going to say? And what are your Jewish friends going to say who might find the cross offensive? And, like, do you go through some of those mental uh, gymnastics? or? Ash Wednesday is a, a funny uh, experiment. You see who comes out of the woodwork and you discover who else is part of the, part of the club. Uh, uh, so I actually enjoy Ash Wednesday for that reason. But, uh, you've you've no. never been bashful about uh, stating your views. No, no, I certainly have not. <laughs> not on campus, not now. No, that's uh, it, you know, when I, when I started out, I started an investment bank, uh, Rothschild, so I was with a lot of uh, uh, Jew, Jews, actually, which is great because they sort of, they sort of got it in a sense. Uh, I was pretty upfront. I said, "Look, you know, uh, I, Sunday is the Lord's day. I'm not going to work on Sunday. Uh, you know, Saturday I've been, and I went plenty of Saturdays, but uh, the Lord's day now I go to mass and I observe observe uh, uh, the Lord's day. Um, you know, I've I've since moved on and that uh, work with a few uh, other Catholics and slip out around noon every day to go to St. Patrick's for mass, and uh, they understand that's part of part of how I observe. I'll work a little later if I have to." Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think there are subcultures in finance where, it, you know, they understand. You know, it's interesting what you said about the, the other organization which had more Jewish employees that I, I found in some of my experience that, oddly enough, sometimes there is more um, resonance and respect between uh, Catholics and Jews or Protestants and Jews, each who take their faith in some degree of seriousness, that, that there's a respect. Like, even though you might disagree on the doctrine or the teaching or the symbolism of what's going on, that there, there's, a, there's a, a respect like, oh, wow, you're taking this kind of seriously. And that, that says something. So sometimes I find, oddly enough, the, it's, it's within one's own tribe where there's more pushback than, than when it's uh, between uh, traditions, if you will. Now, so you're in med school. Uh, and, and tell us, Courtney, the, of course, there's bioethics questions that have to do with faith, uh, the Pope, and there are many uh, Catholic encyclicals and teachings and various things. Uh, but just as a, as a student in med school, how does your faith play out? Is it just something you kind of put in the, your back pocket, or does it resonate something or impact your daily life? Yeah, I would say, um, for me, it definitely does play a big part of my life. And, um, Hold your uh, mic up a little bit. Partly just the notion of it being a vocation, that going into medicine, becoming a doctor is a part of um, this vocation that I have as part of my religion. Um, but I would say I go to Albert Einstein, which is up in the Bronx, kind of East Bronx. It's a little bit separate from Manhattan, the typical daily life. So I would say a lot of people who are there, it's, it is um, heavily Jewish in um, the students who are there, so there there is a lot of devotion, and that's made it easy for me as a Catholic. Um, as you were you were saying, there's a lot of resonance between observant faiths. Um, but I would say, for me, it does play a big role in thinking about um, what kind of doctor I want to become. Um, and the one thing that is difficult is on certain topics, which for me, one thing that's really important is the issue of life, um, and. Uh, this comes up in a big way in the OBGYN field, but in a lot of other fields as well. Just the notion of having some kind of faith puts you at odds with maybe the patients that you might treat. And so if you're too public about what your faith is, you sometimes get a little bit of pushback as to how your patients might feel about coming to you as a doctor. Um, so as a first year, that's still something I'm trying to work through is how do you be an empathetic loving doctor um, that can both treat your patients where they're at um, without compromising your own views. Yeah. So that's 
still something I'm working not, through. Not, I like you said, it's still something you're working through. And, and fair enough. I mean, this is, if it helps the, the six of you know that we've been working at this for 14 years and we still don't have it figured out. But I think the important thing is to ask the question and to wrestle with it, which is some of what we're trying to do. So the, the, some of you will know the statistics. So do you know now that it, when they do surveys of uh, different uh, parts, generations of our country, the, the millennials, that, uh, what is it, somewhere around 30% plus or minus are, are nuns. Did you know that? The Catholic. No, actually, nuns, it's a pun, it's N-O-N-E-S. Meaning when they go through the form, are you, what's your Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, the, uh, uh, or atheist, agnostic, they'll say, well, I'm, I'm kind of none of these. So it, it's people who are spiritually uh, seeking, searching. It uh, doesn't mean they're atheists, but they don't identify with a particular historical tradition. Danny, jump in on that for us. So how do you personally think about it? If you don't mind me asking, if it's not too personal. And also as, you, as your friends, because you've got friends who are very devout in their tradition. You come from uh, two rich traditions. Uh, help us think through that and what you think about that. Yeah, and we were discussing this, I think, a little bit beforehand, too. Yeah. Uh, I come from a city called Brooklyn. It's near, it's near New York. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, 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 that may say a lot. Um, but I find it to be a very entrepreneurial, um, diverse place, actually. Um, and most of my friends uh, come from all different walks of life, come from different faith backgrounds. But I would say there's a unifying uh, interest in spirituality, hmm. uh, which is what we were touching upon earlier. Yeah. And not necessarily a particular faith-based spirituality, but a spirituality uh, founded in, in, I think, tenets of a lot of different religions. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, we were talking about it, sort of a cafeteria style yeah. uh, spirituality yeah. and faith. So in other words, there might be some things about Judaism that resonate, some things about Buddhism, some things about this, that, and it comes together. And, and now, how do you think about that? Do you think that that's um, an ongoing journey? Or do you think that your friends who are in that space are hoping to land or are they actually intentionally hoping not to land in one of the so-called great traditions? I think it's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I find it unlikely that they will. That um, they will land in a tradition, you mean? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them come from faith backgrounds. So mm -hmm. I, have, I have friends that are Israeli and they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and I, have, I, have, I live with an Italian who obviously comes from a Catholic upbringing. Yeah. Um, and I think that they have those backgrounds, but they don't necessarily take them too seriously. Um, and I think that with the breakdown of a lot of community in general in our society right now, people mm -hmm. are sort of grasping mm -hmm. uh, for different sorts of community. So it may get to a point where actually people do get back into the fold of their yeah. uh, original uh, faiths. And, and some of this is, and the data shows, some of this is just um, the thing called life. That, mm -hmm. that I mean, I, m I remember coming back from uh, college, I think it was after my sophomore year. And you all know what the word sophomore means, don't you? It means wa wise fool. It's Greek, wise fool. So anyway, I came back thinking I knew everything. And I remember going to the pastor who ended up later marrying Karen and me. It was not the Pope, I might add. But, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I came back full of vim and vigor of all the reasons why the church was just full of bunk. It was hypocritical. It was mean. It was judgmental. You're in, you're out. My way or the highway. And I had my list of righteous uh, objections. And so I said this to, to Reverend Charles. And, uh, and, and I was, he was sort of a traditional guy. And I was waiting for his pushback. And he said, well, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Talk about taking the wind out of my sails. Like, well, yeah. And he said, and somehow I'll never forget. He said, David, don't ever confuse the church with God. Don't ever confuse the church with God. And I have a hunch, and I see this with people as I get a little bit older and look at my peer group uh, who were like me then and who've gone through different sort of a nun stage, a spiritual stage, that many of them at a certain point in their life uh, return back to the faith of their childhood with a, a, a fresh... Um, respect, uh, and, but still but very honest about its hypocrisy and its, its shortcomings. May I add one more thing? Please, please, yeah. So I think that regardless of the fact that a lot of these folks are not, a lot of my friends and a lot of people that I am around are not necessarily going to church every Sunday yeah. or uh, celebrating the Sabbath, um, I do think that a lot of them try to bring values into their work. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that is something that they're very cognizant of. Um, in a way that perhaps is, is, is quite unique. Yeah. In fact, while you got the mic, um, do you mind sharing a bit about this story? So Danny was in a startup, a uh, small uh, group. You had a very close friend uh, who brought you into it. 
And, and every one of these people, although Courtney I don't know as well, we've had conversations, not just during class, but after class, about ethical dilemmas, where frankly, if I were had been in your shoes, I might have just sucked it up and said, hey, that's the way it is. I got to earn my stripes, and I'm not going to make waves. And each one of you have wrestled with things like, do I want to be associated with this because of the values that did not resonate with your values? And I hugely respect that. Do you mind sharing that vignette briefly? Um, sure, just briefly, because I think you did a good job of summarizing sort of the, uh, the challenge. But... Uh, Prof did advise me through a, a, a very difficult challenge, at least personally for me, uh, with a startup. Uh, company was really taking off. We had a snack food that was sold nationally in Whole Foods. A lot of hard work was paying off. And uh, for a number of reasons, I was uh, experiencing a lot of tension with the CEO, uh, my co-founder and friend. Um, a co-founder, friend, and CEO. A little was, tricky, right? It was, it was very tricky. And um, I ended up leaving the company uh, despite the fact that I think I, I could have probably come over with it quite a bit um, because it just didn't resonate with me uh, anymore. And Prof helped me through a lot of very challenging uh, ethical dilemmas. Now, all I did was ask questions. You, you got to the answers, but it takes courage. I mean, he left a lot of money on the table, and he could have uh, ridden that out for another 18 months. And, and um, But also he was concerned, and tell me if I'm misremembering this story, that you... You were also worried about your own reputation because there are some practices that you weren't pleased with, and who knows how it might later uh, go. There's, uh, in fact, uh, Richard Deloitte talks a lot about uh, brand. What's your personal brand? Uh, and I was just with a retired uh, GE executive down in Australia, and he was talking about what's your brand? What do you want to be known for? Uh, uh, and some of the guests that come to class will talk about that, that same thing. Lauren, how do you think about this space of... Uh, uh, it's so difficult to be in finance. Uh, do you find even what you're doing is worthwhile? Like if meaning and purpose matters to you, you want to do something bigger in life, do you feel you're just moving one bucket of money around from one rich person to the next? Or, or can you find uh, something bigger there? Yeah, so when I was you know, a junior going through the whole recruiting process for investment banking, I was you know, super excited to, to go on Wall Street and, and be a hotshot investment banker. Um, and you know the internship was great because it's like two or three months and you don't really have that much responsibility and you only do it for a short period of time so you can kind of I guess I think other thoughts don't really enter your head when you're at work um, and then as I kind of entered the real world and had to do it on a daily basis I my main struggle was just I thought like with what I was entering I was gonna be so passionate and happy about and maybe this is kind of the millennial issue that I wanted to really have a greater meaning in my in my job or what I'm doing but uh, for me, it wasn't an issue of like, could I work those long hours or put in all the hard work? Because I pretty much my entire life, I between tennis and school, I had to to, to stay up late, study, yeah, so and also physically, you. Yeah. you know, physically exert a lot of effort. But for me, it was I like I didn't feel like I could do it when I wasn't really passionate about the work that I was doing. And that's that's not to say that you know, investment banking has no purpose or that it's not uh, there's not you know good that comes out of that. And I think it's very essential to the economy and to the world to to have people providing these services. But for me, the main struggle, and this is something that we spoke about on the phone, when I was kind of, uh, when I had worked pretty much every single day for like three months, uh, but I just really didn't feel that resonate, like that didn't really resonate with the higher goal of what I was doing, and I couldn't see myself in really my boss's shoes ever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something important and that people talk a lot about is can you see yourself in, in kind of your boss's shoes? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not necessarily like how, how long will it take you to get in that position, but would you want to be in that position? Um, and... So Yoni actually brought up something uh, really n nice earlier. Was like you learn a lot about what you don't like and not necessarily what you do like. Yeah. So uh, I think these first two years have been a lot of search, like realizing what I don't like, uh, and it's really been hard to find the answer of what I want to do or, or what I do like. Uh, and I think that's part of life is having these different positions and having different jobs and kind of figuring out what's important to you, uh, whether it's a job that gives you a better work-life balance or a job that makes you feel like you're you're. You know, impacting the world in some way. Yeah. So that's kind of been my yeah. thought process and kind of stuff I've, been, I've dealt with over the past couple of years of the workforce. And as we, we were, we've had some conversation about that and, and without going into all the details, I remember you were, we were talking about this sort of this, sometimes just the reality of whatever your job is, that, that the entry level jobs are often, you know, you're mucking out the, the stalls. You're cleaning up someone else's stuff and, and it's hard. You have to earn your stripes, learn the business, uh, develop a certain credibility before going forward. And no matter what generation we're in, that's hard. And I think you all are in various stages of those early days where you earn your stripes. Uh, uh, 
and even if there's an impatience to move forward. Like, at what point do you say, I'm going to shake the dust off my sandals and move on? And at what point do you say, well, no, let me hang in there a bit longer and see if I could figure something out? Were you going to jump in, Zach? Going no. back a ways, but I don't know if we're... That's all right. You can if you want, or we, could, we can move on. Sure. All right, all right. <laughs> So, Kate, as an English major with all uh, so many of these finance guys surrounding you, um, t tell me how you think about the business world. Because you come from a family, uh, uh, Kate's uh, a father and uncle are the founders of The Motley Fool. Some of you will know them and maybe subscribe to their services. You've interned there and worked there. How do you think, as, as a, I mean, if you'll pardon the pun, you see the world differently, not just because of your virtual reality goggles, but as an English major, a humanities major, uh, maybe a bit like Danny as, as a religious uh, religion major. What do you think about these things they're talking about? Absolutely. Well, I will say both my dad and my uncle were English majors, and the, the name of the company comes from Shakespeare. So that's always actually been something that... Because um, who is the motley fool? It's the <laughs> truth teller, right? Yes, It's the court exactly. jester, the only one who can't get killed uh, by telling the truth. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, to Wall Street. Um, so um, I think that... Um, Growing up, being at Princeton, now being in the media world, um, just seeing the, the importance of uh, focusing on relationship, um, huh. first and foremost, that, um, you know, as a, you know, as a Christian, um, in my, uh, uh, my understanding is that we are called first and foremost to love God and then love people. Um, you kind of forget that yeah. sometimes, don't we? Love God first and love people. That's to love God with all your mind, heart, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That, that's the classic Jewish teaching. Now I, now, I can't think of the rabbi's name, but he was, maybe it was Hillel or someone. If you have to stand on one foot, what would you say? And that's the sum total. Um, Karl Barth, the Swiss theologian, the Protestant, was asked the same question from a Christian tradition. And he said, if you have to write it on a postcard, what's Christianity all about? And he sang that childhood song, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so this love, this mess. But anyway, I interrupt. Go ahead. No, absolutely. And I, I mean, so how I we really... love in investment banking? My <laughs> goodness. Um, the, the narrative. I think tapping into story, tapping huh. into um, where is it that, that we come from, what is the context of um, where we sense God leading us, um, and how do we stay, stay true to that, um, keep it about um, our sense of connection with each other. Hmm. Zach. Who would jump in here? Uh, Hold the mic the, up a bit, please. Yeah, the, the subject of relationship is, is very interesting uh, because at Princeton I saw a lot of conversions, a lot of, uh, of my peers who, you know, whether coming from a non-Christian uh, background or uh, a different background or a Protestant background, I saw a lot of people who, who converted to, uh, to the church. And uh, what, what drove that? Well, it was... It was not necessarily intellectual. It was not necessarily, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, seeing a vision. It was friendship more than anything oh. else. Uh, friendship and you know the philea, the the love, brotherly love, uh, that that shared the gospel. And I, you know, talking about the nuns, the thirty percent who who don't who are sort of uh, who are seeking. I, I think uh, I think they're hungry for for something. And I think uh, you know that something mm. is. Uh, is the fellowship the uh, you know the something spiritual? I think has has something to do with love, and I think uh, you know as as a Catholic Christian who you know, part of our mission, of course, a huge part of our mission is to evangelize. The best way to do that is through friendship. Uh, so. So I want to move in a moment to questions from you folks. So get a sense to get ready to to think of one. Um, so there's a good as. The investment bankers here in the, in the room will know um, that when you're completing your due diligence, you're about to buy a, a, a company or do a deal or a final, final transaction. The final question you ask is, what should I have asked you that I didn't? So what might you have been anticipating that we'd be talking about that uh, is just on your mind that you want to share either to debunk uh, some of the stereotypes that exist about millennials or just part of your own story that you want to share? Um, Courtney, can you want to start us off? Yeah. And maybe well, each of you, if, if you think of something, uh, fine. If not, that's fine. Yeah. Just a comment on um, someone earlier had mentioned millennials. Just do your job. Just it's just a job. Just work. Um, so I, I got it, Jeff. Kind of curious. Um, <laughs> and by the way, he's a great boss. Yes, I I wanted to maybe maybe complicate the Please. question and and ask whether millennials would be more comfortable just doing their job if they knew how to do leisure well. If we could really separate our life, um, 
apart from our work if we would be better at just doing our jobs. Um, I think a lot of the working world, especially in New York, knows you know working 18, 20 hours a day. Um, so you don't really know how to separate leisure from work. So maybe if we're able to do I'll that in a better way, yeah. um, we could kind of when improve work, our work, work ethic. Yeah. When you're at work, do your work. And then um, I don't know if technology allows us to understand true leisure anymore. Yeah. But um, huh. Now you have just yeah. hit me with a big challenge because a lot of what we talk about here is integrating faith and work. And a lot of my research talks about integrating faith and work, which I still ascribe to. But if we almost over-integrate, or in this case, leisure and work, the boundaries are hard. It's a very interesting thought, very interesting thought. Is that it? As a philosophy major, I have to jump in and say uh -oh. that uh, Aristotle made a distinction between rest and leisure. So, yeah. uh, you know, rest is detox so that you can work. It's instrumental to work. Leisure is a som something entirely different. Uh, it's an activity unto itself, and I think our generation has forgotten what that is. So have you forgotten the rest part which prepares you for the leisure? Or is it, which of the, so there's, if there's work, rest, leisure, which part has your generation uh, been, lost the boundaries? I would say, I would say leisure. Uh, so rest prepares you to work. You know, you, you work 18 hours a day, you need to kick back and watch that TV show, you need to, you know, just yeah. take it easy. Just that prepares out. you so you can go back to work. Leisure, what, what is leisure? It's, it's something in the absence of having to, to yeah. rest or to work. Yeah. And you know, we both uh, read a book that was very formative on this uh, by Joseph Pieper, a great philosopher, uh, called Leisure, the Basis of Culture. And leisure as a basis? Leisure, the basis of culture. The basis for culture. I, I would recommend that book. Uh, but Leisure as Contemplation, as, uh, uh, well, Thank read you. the book. Oh, terrific. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to go to question in a second. Yoni, do you, want, do you have anything you want to share at the moment, or do you want to uh, loop back later? Um, I guess I could quickly sure. just share. Uh, something I've been trying to reconcile is who I am at. I know this is generally fits in who you are at work versus who you are around your friends. Oh, yeah. And um, I'm, I think I'm generally a very you know, quiet person. Uh, I try to be modest, try to be like I speak softly, whereas at work I do a lot of yelling. Like you have to be aggressive. And it's very hard to like understand like what is going on you know, when I transition from one to the other and why does it have to be that way? Mm. Uh, so it's just something I've been trying to grapple with and I think really thinking about your, your faith uh, is a way to channel a framework for understanding who you are when and why and how to take the best parts of which and put them together. That's interesting. Yeah, the faith could be maybe the adjudicating or mediating factor between these two personas. Fascinating, fascinating. Kate, do you have a, a reflection or a due diligence response or a pass for yeah. now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I think that um, something I was so blessed by being in Professor Miller's class at Princeton was yeah. thinking about what are the, um, the touch points that a lot of different um, fields or people, faiths can find. And I think values is something that we keep coming back to is um, a point of where we all as humans can can resonate. And um, those are be they stories, be they um, points of businesses um, in impacts uh, that people can have in the world that most stick with us mm -hmm. and can build a um, sense of connection is, is through character. Mm. Um, and so how can we share that? Um, you know, between generations as well. Well, clearly we are going to learn some things from this generation tonight. Thank you, Kate. That's great. Florin, any uh, final thoughts so you might have? I, uh, after all the classes we had together, you asked every single person that came to speak to us, uh -oh. you know, what was one moment in their, like, career where they really felt like they, they, were, they were tested and their oh. kind of faith and, and religion were tested. So that's the question I thought you were going to ask us. So that's just what I want to ask you now. Uh, I, yeah, you set yeah. me up. Do, do you have one? Um, so I mean, I don't, I, compared to some of the stories we heard in class, it's really not that big a deal. But for example, like I was working on, we were advising this company on a, on a transaction, uh, and the company itself was providing basically phone service to uh, you know inmates in, in prisons and jails. Um, and at first, that seems it's okay. I didn't know that industry existed, but uh, it's a service that needs to be provided. Um, so then I started to read about the company and read all these Yelp reviews. Uh, and basically all these, you know, all these people that were, who had loved ones who were, you know, in prison or jail were going on Yelp and saying pretty much like every single company in that space was charging these exorbitant prices to pretty much 
you know, every single inmate and they happen across the industry. So that was a th like, it's not, I really didn't have much choice. I can't say like, I'm not going to work on this deal because that's wrong. But uh, on the other hand, it got me thinking like, that's, you know, th are these companies taking advantage of, of these poor people in jail? Um, and that was a kind of a time where I had to look inside myself to kind of figure out uh, how I felt about it. Yeah. But it, actually, that's a powerful example because you're at the wrong end of the power power totem pole right now. But the fact that, that your your spirit, your intellect, your faith raised that question, don't ever lose that, please, because someday you'll be in a position to make more of a difference. And you might even be surprised now just even asking the question, like, are we comfortable with this? Is this is, is this a deal? Is is the is it really worth it? Because uh, you'll find, and and not to call out, but but it's public knowledge. I've seen Deloitte walk away from legal deals that just didn't fit with what their brand was. I've seen Citibank walk away from legal deals they just didn't want to do credits. So you might be surprised how often uh, someone senior will appreciate you raising it, even if you get told shut up, salute, and fly straight. Um, don't lose that. That's a beautiful thing. But on the positive note, I did benchmark the prices we were charging versus the competitors, and we were lower than the rest of them. <laughs> but, uh, I love it. That's funny. That's great. Danny, do you have a, something you that you just want to share? Yeah. Uh, it was something that I've incorporated into my work since graduating from college, and I've worked in digital innovation, and I've worked for big media companies and now startups, um, is a is a, a philosophy that you actually taught us in, in class, which is how can we make the small area around us better? Hmm. Um, and that's something that I've kept with me uh, regardless of my, my faith interest. Um, and I think having that sort of value orientation is, is very helpful. Hmm. Um, so wow. yeah, and thank you well, for having us well, here. Well, I'm, I'm touched. That's blown me away. Um, and I want to wrap up with a, a short video and then give everyone a, a huge round of applause. Uh, in fact, let's start with the applause. How about just... just <laughs>